Howdy YouTube family, it's Bolt SRNA coming to you again with another day's topic. So today we're talking about moving cross country for your new job. Uh, when you get out of school, if a lot of you moved you know, cross country for a, a school somewhere else, and now you're trying to move back home. I specifically had someone hit me up just, I think today, and said that they're trying to go back to Oregon. Uh, and they're like, I think Pennsylvania or something like that. They, they're in school in Pennsylvania. So people are trying to figure out like, logistically, how do you do this? What's the process? So we can talk about that. And we can talk about what you can expect your salary to be like as a new grad uh, in, in, at a CRNA school. So let's get into that now. All right, so this applies to all of you guys who have moved cross country. You're somewhere else, you're, you wanna go back home, your wife, your kids, your girlfriend, your husband, whatever. Uh, your family is all back in some other state and you've been away for three years and you're missing them and you really like to get back there and be in a practice near by them. So a good idea is look at the hospital that you used to work at as an RN when you were back there. Look at that facility. You should have connections there. You should know people there. If you connect with them there and find out it's a good practice, then you've got an inroad already. That, uh, and so you, you look like a good candidate to them. So hit them up. Now, if it's, you might find that, I mean, there are plenty of hospitals that are great to practice at as a nurse, but then are not good to work at as a CRNA. The practice environment's very different in the anesthesia realm for that hospital, and it's just not a good place for you to work. So then you have to reach out and look at other positions around there and use your connections and networking there in that town to, to get connected. Uh, there are other people like myself who, um, my hometown is actually Chattanooga, Tennessee, but I, and I don't live there now, but I live within hours of it at least so I can drive there. Um, but I'm actually moving to California and, uh, and that's a mixture of things, mostly because of the weather, but also because the practice opportunity was amazing. Um, so, and I used to live there before school and I really liked California and how they have beaches and they have, you know, mountains with snowing and skiing on it. And then they've got, you know, redwood trees and hiking. So pretty much anything you want, they have there. Uh, so I'm moving back there. I'm moving cross country as well. I'm having to go through the process of figuring out what am I going to throw away here? What am I going to pack up? Um, how much is it going to cost me to ship my car there? And how much will it cost me to fly there? And I'm going to have to sedate my dog, I guess, so I can put him in the you know, plane with me. Um, all this logistic stuff, which you'll have to approach when you get to that point. But there, it's a very real situation when you're having to move back cross country. If you already moved cross country to your CRNA position at your school, you probably have already done all these things. So you'll just have to do it again in reverse. There's no special magic to finding a position back home that's not with I mean, of course, I mentioned in my other videos about networking and interviews and all that kind of stuff. That's all relevant and very much applies to the situation. So on to the hot topic that you guys are all probably mostly interested in. What is the salary of a new grad CRNA currently in today's market? Well, I can tell you that's gonna vary a lot by location. So your location is gonna determine a lot of what you're gonna get paid. Uh, it also determines what your cost of living is. So I'm sure a lot of you understand that already from being RNs that somebody working in Alabama where your house, a decent house costs $100,000 is not gonna make the same income as someone who lives in San Francisco where the same house that would be $100,000 in Alabama is probably gonna be a million dollars or $1.1 million in San Francisco. Um, it's outrageously expensive there. I used to live over there. It's, it's crazy expensive. Uh, but that is just a, a kind of a, a severe example of how salaries vary very much. Um, a CRNA in Alabama, I've seen positions posted as low as $140,000 a year. Um, now granted, <clears throat> another thing you have to take into account is the um, responsibilities and the hours required for your job. So if your job is a, a, what, what's called a lifestyle position, you're not gonna make that much money because it's a lifestyle position. You're, you're not working very much. You're not having to do very much. Um, it's it's pretty, pretty much like a cakewalk type job for anesthesia. Uh, whereas another job that's 
going to require a lot of your responsibility, a lot of your hours. You have to take call. You have to perform a lot of blocks and lines, and you know maybe it's a CRNA only practice, and you're on call every fifth day or something. Um, and you have to run OB. You have to manage you know one year old pediatric emergencies and stuff. Um, if you're doing that kind of stuff, then yeah, of course, your pay is gonna be significantly higher. So it depends on the, the job requirements slash you know, practice requirements and the region that you're in mostly for the type of pay you're gonna get. Um, so like I was saying, a pretty cakewalk job in Alabama where the cost of living's low, probably 140,000 as a new graduate. That's, that's what I've seen. And I've, I've seen a couple people take those jobs. Me personally, never would ever do that in 100 years. But there are some people who do because their families are from those small rural towns. They already own a home over there. Um, they, they have a, two newborns or a newborn and like a one or two year old at home and they wanna be at home with their wife and their, their you know, mom and dad live down the street and stuff. They just, and they've been in school and working their butts off for the last decade. You know, so they, they would like to be able to settle down for a while and the money's not that important to them. 140000 plus their spouse's income is going to be fine for them to live comfortably and happily. And that's great. You know, that's their priorities. Um, and usually those jobs, they work like Monday through Friday, maybe 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. A lot of times I have like catered in lunches. They have anesthesia techs that, you know, are their assistants pretty much and do a lot of their work for them, like turning over their rooms and a lot of the manual labor that goes along with anesthesia is done a lot of times by anesthesia techs. Um, they, they do like more simple cases that are not as stressful. Um, it's, it's just nice. They don't ever have to take call a lot of times. They don't have to do a lot of their, someone else does their pre-ops or their blocks and all the extra work for them like that. They really just have to manage the patient in the middle of the procedure. Um, so, so those, yeah, you don't, you're not gonna make as much. So if that's the kind of position you want, you're, you won't make as much money. But it may not be as important to you to make that kind of money. Then you have your other extreme, which is gonna be like a CRNA only practice in Eagle Pass, Texas, um, which is actually was a job posted not long ago and a couple of my buddies were, were heavily interested in it. I used to live in Corpus Christi, Texas, so I knew where Eagle Pass, Texas was and I was not interested. Uh, I don't care how much money they're paying. But a couple of my buddies, they were, they were definitely poking around figuring out what, what the deal was with that practice because the starting pay even for a new graduate was greater than 300,000. The deal with this is you may be, I, I wanna say you might be the only person in the hospital at a time. Uh, there might be one or two other people who could be there, possibly rotating around, but that's usually how these type of positions work where the pay is just really, really high. It means you are dealing with patients, you're like a one-man army a lot of times, uh, which some CRNAs are totally, especially experienced CRNAs, are totally capable of doing that and very good at doing that. And a lot of those kind of positions are ran by CRNAs. Uh, but as a new graduate, I don't really recommend that kind of role because I don't care whether you're a new graduate physician anesthesiologist or a new graduate uh, CRNA, um, nobody com comes right out of training being as skilled and capable as someone with five or 10 years of experience already out. You, your first year or two out of school is, is a high learning curve and everyone who's an anesthesia professional has told me that and I've watched it, I've witnessed it as I've precepted with first year students and I've, I've uh, precepted and worked under you know, brand new uh, attendings who just came out of residency. You can tell there's a difference and there, there's still learning happening. They're still getting into your own comfort zone, your own skin. Um, and you need mentors. You need people who are around you who not necessarily hold your hand, but people who are around who could be like, yeah, that's a good idea. I'd do the same thing. Or, or uh, you, know, I, you know what I did is this, that, and the other. And they give you tips and tricks on things that they've done or things that they've seen. Because simply just with the experience comes better practice. Um, for a job like somewhere near the border of Texas, where you're dealing with mothers who have TB and have had no prenatal care and are suddenly coming into you screaming in pain and labor and it's like some kind of previa happening and you have to do like an emergency C-section or something. I mean, you're talking about a lot of complications. You're talking about a lot of risks. Um, you need somebody with experience. So yes, 
There are positions, if you want to take them, that are gonna be greater than $300,000 a year. You're gonna have a lot of stress. You're gonna be working very, very hard. Um, I'm talking probably 60 hours a week, uh, maybe more. Uh, you're gonna be taking a lot of call. Um, it's gonna be a lot, of, a lot of tough work, and you're gonna be doing it on your own, and it could potentially be risky for you or your patients. So, those are your two extremes. There is a ton of positions and salaries and different levels of autonomy all in the middle. The best thing you can do is figure out what is most important to you. So make a list when you're looking for these jobs and you're looking for these things, make a list of what's most important to you. Your autonomy slash practice, your pay, or your location. Those are your three things. You will probably never get all three. You will if you're lucky, get two of the three. So figure out which of these are the most important, line them up, and then start looking for positions that match that list that you set out. If money is your most important thing and you don't care about practice and autonomy or the region of the United States that you live in, you can go find the best money. There are positions that pay a lot of money and they're, they're not dangerous or anything. They just are smaller hospitals, um, maybe has a negative history or has an anesthesia practice that's not very friendly to CRNAs um, or it might be like in a very cold part of the United States or a very uninteresting part of the United States that nobody wants to live in so they have to pay a lot of money to recruit people there so you could go out there make a lot of money doing that I have some friends that took jobs that were you know 275 you know a year they're, they're making a lot um, but they're also in areas where it's, you know, two Walmarts and, you know, three red lights. You know, it's not interesting. And there's the, it's in an area that's just not, not pretty. You know, it's not an interesting area you want to live in. And I even interviewed in a place that um, wasn't quite that small, but it was, it was not, not interesting, I would say. Not a pretty area. The pay was really good. The practice opportunity was great. But I just knew at the end of the day, to me, the region of the United States I live in and the ability for me on my off days to enjoy where I'm living, that's important enough to me that I said, no, you know, I, I appreciated the offer and there was a lot of other great things about it, but I said, no, this is not gonna work because I won't stay here long term and I don't wanna come just to leave in a year or two. I was very lucky in being able to find almost all three. It, I got like two and a half or 2.75 of my three. Um, and, and that was mostly because I'm extremely flexible and I was able to say like, I can move and I can do whatever you need. And also because I was capable of doing regional, uh, because I've really pushed in school to learn a lot of that and really, you know, pushed in clinical to get a lot of experience with that. So I, I was able to come into a position, not afraid to be able to do regional and lines and be independent and those type of things. So if you are able to do those things and you push yourself in, in CRNA school to really get the best education and you pick the right kind of programs, when you get out, you're going to be able to find more of those three things that you want and a better percentage of them than some other people might. All right, guys. So we talked about salary. We talked about practice and stuff and what makes up your salary ranges. I hope that makes sense to you guys. It's a very different world compared to being an RN and you know you come in and being an RN, especially in the ICU, it's expected that you're going to be able to do a certain number of things and they're going to say, here's your hour, hourly rate and you're going to assume that you're going to work three twelves or something like that and you're just going to go in and do your job. And you know, if you work night shift, you're going to shift, shift differential and if you work day shift, you won't. And that's about as complicated as it gets. It's just pretty cut and dry. Uh, for CRNA, it's very, very different. Um, it's a lot of contracts and negotiations and, um, and different types of pay things. Oh, another thing is uh, salary is not the only thing that factors into your income as a CRNA. So you have to factor in, is your malpractice paid for? If your malpractice is paid for, that could be thousands of dollars a year that you don't have to pay out of pocket. If they don't cover it, that's thousands. So they could make, they could pay you a little more up money up front, but if you've got to pay for your own malpractice, let's go ahead and subtract that off your income because you're just gonna have to pay for your own malpractice. If some, uh, most places will pay for your health insurance and your dental insurance and vision insurance. Uh, if they don't do that, then again, you're talking about thousands of dollars a year. Go ahead and subtract that off your total income because you have to pay for that on your own. Paid vacation. Uh, look at how many weeks of paid vacation you get. If you're getting six weeks of paid time off, which is the pretty standard for 
a new graduate in, a, in an anesthesia job, that's a substantial amount of money that they're paying you to go on vacation. So that's a pretty good perk. Uh, you have to think about your continuing med medical education income. A lot of practices pay you uh, $2,000 a year just to go to anesthesia conferences, pay professional dues to like the AANA, um, maybe even buy a new laptop to you know do your professional work on or something like that. So $2,000 a year is usually the typical amount. Um, you have to think about that. Some places may not offer it at all. Some places may offer more than that. Uh, some, some places offer that, but then they tell you you can't use it for this, that, and the other so that it's so restrictive you almost can't use it at all. So it's kind of like a trick in the contract. You also have to consider, is it gonna be a 1099 position, which means independent contractor, or are you a W-2 position, which means a typical employee like you were used to being as an RN? Um, and I'll talk about the differences between 1099 and W-2 in a whole different video because it's very complicated and it gets involved in tax laws and things like that. So that's a whole different topic. But you have to consider that option as well. So those are just some of the things that you have to think about when you're looking at salaries and different jobs and all that stuff. So I hope this has answered all of your questions. If you have any more, which is totally fine if you do because it's kind of a confusing topic, you can hit me up in the comments below and you can go over to my Instagram, which is boltsrna. You can follow me over there. You can direct message me there or you know, follow my stories or whatever. I, I post pretty frequently over there. Try and, try and keep up on that one. Um, but otherwise, that's Bolt out.